Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. The channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. That can be directly or indirectly, with domestic animals or with wildlife. If with wild animals, then what it takes to work with free living animals or animals in captivity. Whatever the sector is, we aim to cover it all. And most weeks I interview an animal industry professional who provides insight with information on their skills and personal qualities that they needed to be successful in their careers. My next guest is Jemima Parry Jones, MBE. Director of the International Bird of Prey Centre here in the UK. Jemima has been a director at large with the Raptor Research Foundation. She has written books and her Bird of Prey Centre was the first one in the UK. Jemima joins me now. Jemima Parry Jones, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Hi, good to see you. Jemima, please can you tell us about this fantastic hawk on your fist? Well, yes, actually it's not a hawk, it's a kite. Um, this is a very boring brown, but somewhat excitable. Uh, Yellow-billed kite. You can see that she has a yellow bill. Her name is Lambrusca. She was bred here at the centre and she is now 25 years old. So, in fact, she's just retired and she's been checked by the vet today and she's going to go into an aviary with her two years older sister to spend the rest of her life retired and having fun watching the visitors. Fantastic. Jemima, how, what's her status in the wild? In the wild? Yeah. Well, kites are really interesting because if you look at the black kites, for example, in India, which I have seen, and they're literally in their millions, it isn't until the numbers drop quite significantly that you can see whether or not there is a decline. We think we're seeing a decline in India and it may well be that we see a decline across their range because of all sorts of things, food, pesticides, in, lack of insects, the whole caboodle. Jemima, what are the skills, personal experiences and qualities that have been key to your success, please? <laughs> uh, bullheadedness, workaholic, ability to not late, take any rubbish from anybody, but to understand that there are times when you have to be tactful and times when you have to put your foot down. Um, practical things, it's really important that you can do things like DIY, that you can solve problems, uh, not only in your own country, but in another country. Um, and I think that's probably about it. Fantastic. Shimana, what conference themes have most influenced your thinking? Well, one of the things you did when you first got hold of me is you asked me what books had affected my interest in conservation. And I told you that actually it wasn't books. It was, um, sorry about the hairstyle, you can see why. Uh, it was uh, going to conferences. So I started going to conferences in 1981. And it was very interesting. When I first went, I was a non-scientist. I was female. I was relatively young. I was a falconer. And I ran a bird of prey center, which had captive birds. And you could not have had more things against you going to a scientific raptor conference than that. That was it. So... I have to say I was not treated particularly well by some of the people at the conference. However, some of them were so unpleasant that they did me a favor because other people felt sorry for me. <laughs> and so I started to get friends and I, I left that conference thinking, okay, well, I'm not sure I want to do this. I'm not sure I can battle against these people. And being the personality I am, I thought, no, sod it. 
um, I will go to another conference and I will keep going. And that's exactly what I did. And I used to sit next to people who I thought wouldn't mind me sitting next to them. These days, people want to sit next to me, which is nice. Um, I used to ask them questions. I used to, I listened to every, I was known for going to every damn paper that I could to start with. I don't do that quite anymore. Um, and I have to say that the papers when I first started going were a jolly sight more interesting than they are now because they had a lot of photographs of birds and stuff about what birds are doing. It tends to be a lot of graphs and a lot of um, computer stuff these days, which is slightly less interesting to watch. I do remember going to, to one conference in Israel a long time ago. And it was at the time when we didn't have very much digital stuff. So everybody had photographs and then they had tiny, tiny little Excel files. And the whole of the audience was sitting at the back looking at this damn screen with binoculars. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Jemima, what has been the contribution of falconers to global bird of prey conservation? Sorry, can you repeat that? What has been the what? Yes. What has been the contribution by falconers to global raptor conservation today? Well, until fairly recently, almost every conservation breeding program was either started by falconers, run by falconers, or had input by falconers. That's slightly less so now because it's got quite a lot broader, but the, the thing about falconry the thing about having a bird this close about, I know what you're going to do on my carpet, aren't you? Is that you have, you end up with a different insight into the bird. Ian Newton's a good friend of mine. In fact, I just have his tractor now and it's a very nice tractor. And he used to come here and he would look out of the window or we'd be talking about something. And I say, oh look, Topaz is flying or something. And he said, can you recognize that bird from here? Just by sitting here and I said yes I know how she flies I know what her behavior is and so my scientist friends all do a tremendous amount of monitoring and they know a lot about the birds in the wild but they don't have that extra insight that that falconers and captive breeders do where you're breeding birds you 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 have birds doing incubation you do incubation you hatch eggs you rear chicks all of that gives you a different insight into the birds in the wild. And I think that has been a good influence um, that falconry has put towards conservation. There are bad influences as well, but generally I think falconry has been a good thing for conservation. That's really interesting. Jemima, what is your view of the Bird of Prey Centre sector today? <laughs> I'm not sure I can tell you that and be polite. Um, it's very difficult for me to judge. A, I don't go around to them because I don't have time. I'm a workaholic and I stay here and I work all day and all night and seven days a week and the whole caboodle. Um, and B, as I have a whole load of birds of prey and I have a bird of prey center and my father started it, to a certain degree, we are responsible, my father and I, although he's dead so he doesn't have to worry anymore, um, for the fact that there are a lot of bird of prey centers because lots of people would come here, they would see what we do and what the, what the mistake they made, the two mistakes they made, is number one, whenever people would come, we would in those days sit down and chat to them which made it look as if you had a lot of time to sit down and chat to people and have fun. What they didn't see was the racing around trying to catch up with all the things we should have been doing when we were talking to them. Um, and so it gave people a slightly different impression of what it's like to run one of these. The other difference is that when my father started and when I was involved, which was from the get-go, we got birds slowly. We started with, I think, 10 birds, and then we slowly increased the number. And in fact, what I've done now is decrease the number. It's not a question of numbers. It's a question of quality, understanding your birds, 
keeping them in the best possible way. And I'm afraid to say that a large number of so-called bird of prey centers do not follow those rules. I was talking to somebody once who said that the maximum number of birds he could handle running a center was 15. That's him by himself. I don't know what you think of that, whether that is, is too many. Is that, is that it, 15? Is that 15 that he's flying or 15 in total in aviaries as well? I'm going to go and put her down in a minute if she gets unsettled. Yeah, um, if you've got birds in aviaries, you've got to clean the aviary. You've got to make sure they've got fresh bath water pretty much every day, and you can guarantee they'll make a mess in it. Um, I have about 150 birds of prey at the moment, and I have five bird staff plus myself and Holly. So that's seven. And although I don't clean aviaries very often, I do all the, a lot of the flying. I help with the hospital. I do clean in the hospital because we haven't got anybody at the moment. We also have a significant number of absolutely amazing volunteers and we still don't get everything done in a day. And it still isn't quite as great here as I would like it to be. And I, th I think people don't understand quite what needs to be done to make a place acceptable to the general public, good for the birds' welfare, and putting over the right message. That's the second time this bird's quack. Would you like to pause, Jemima, and put her back? We have a hospital at the centre. We've had a hospital. We've been taking injured wild birds in pretty much from day one. Um, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't something that we wanted to do, but because we're open to the public, if the public find birds, what the first thing they do is they phone the RSPB who don't accept injured wild birds. Then they phone the RSPCA who never answer the telephone. Um, and in the end, they panic, and so they phone us. I ended up, one woman phoned me up and said, I've got two white terriers have turned up at the pub. What do I do? And she was in Southampton for crying out loud. So um, I found a telephone number for her. But yes, it, we, I felt years ago that it would be a bad thing to turn them away. And I don't want to turn them away anyway. And so we have been taking in injured wild birds of prey for a very long time. And in 2014, we built a hospital. And damn me, we're gonna now have to build another one uh, because of avian influenza. So we're starting a fundraising thing, scheme, whatever, any minute now, because for us to take in injured wild birds into the hospital, which our own birds also go into is high risk because of avian influenza. So we have a building that is away from the, the, the rest of the center, which we are going to turn into a new hospital so that people can come in. The bird staff don't have to go down there apart from the person who's looking after it. Um, and that should work very much better. And it will mean that we won't have to do what we did this year, which is actually stop taking them in during the winter, which I hate doing. I came to the center many, many years ago and you signed that and <laughs> that and they then had pride of place on my metaphorical mantelpiece and they're probably the most well-traveled books in the world because after you signed them about three days later they were on a plane with me and they lived on my mantelpiece in brazil for 16 years wow and I brought them back to here to northern england and uh, I dip into them on a very regular basis. Thank you for signing those. They're treasured possessions. Well, my, my, my father wrote a book as well, um, <laughs> which I admit I have not read. <laughs> I probably should have done. Occasionally I dip into the ones I've read and I go, good Lord, did I write that? I'd quite like to write another one now because I think it's really important to not admit, to, but to face up to things that change. Uh, somebody sent me a link to a video that I did years ago, and I look great. I can't believe how good I look. It's wonderful. Uh, unfortunately, I don't look that good now. And they, so I had a look at it, and I thought, most of it's okay, 
but I'd really like to redo it because there are some things about which I have changed my opinion. And I think it's really important to own up when you say, okay, well, we did that then, but actually we know better now. Um, and I, I'd like to do that. Jemima, can you summarize the book writing stroke authoring stroke publishing process, please? Do I follow it? How do I follow it? Can you can you tell us what happens? What's involved in, in writing and getting published? Oh, it's easy. You wait till somebody asks you to write a book. <laughs> then you don't have to worry. I only wrote one book, which I had not asked anybody if they wanted me to write, which was actually a story about uh, my old Eagle Owl Mozart, and that never got printed. In fact, I think I had it printed myself on Kindle, so you can get it on Amazon, but... Um, the others, I was asked to write them all. Years ago, I did a film called The Falconer's Tale, which was a bit flinchy to watch now. Um, I didn't look as good then as I did on the videos I did. Um, and that brought in people wanting me to write books. Fantastic. Uh, Jemima, how, do, well, this is two questions, really. How do you see the bird of prey center sector developing over the next 20 years? I think they have to be very, very careful. I think they have to think outside the box, look and see what the public like and don't like. Um, the, the public, particularly now you have that god awful anti-social media, which I do not like, but which is scarily powerful. It means, and, and why people video or take pictures of their breakfast with their phone and put it on Facebook, I do not know. But everybody takes everything on their phone. So it only takes you to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, people to not understand what's just happened for things to go badly wrong. So I think falconers and falconry has to be very, very aware the shooting fraternity are beginning to be aware that if they don't behave themselves, they'll lose shooting. Fox hunting has already gone. Um, I don't know whether fishing will ever be pointed out, but I suspect it will because there are more and more people who are vegetarians and vegans who don't like anything done to wildlife or to animals. And so the pressure is on. Um, and what I say to them, when because we get accused of all sorts of things we have people say well why have you got these birds why don't you let them all loose not that they'd survive um i like to point out that if we hadn't done what we do now and we hadn't learned the things we had which we share then i would not have been involved in the project in india for example where to be quite frank if i had not been involved in the conservation breeding of vultures in india and nepal that thing would never have got off the ground. And so there's a lot that you can do that's very good, but I think people are walking around blinkered at the moment. This is a related question, but a relevant one, I think. Uh, how do you see global raptor conservation developing over the next 20 years? Well, I mean, up until February last year, I had a very different view on it than I do now. Uh, we have just had a pandemic with humans. And for example, in India right now, they're having misery with both COVID and with this new thing, black, whatever it is. Um, so it's very hard to get people in India to focus on conservation. Um, but, you know, tigers are dying, vultures are dying. Um, if you if we don't get it right soon, it will be too late. So I think it's a bigger picture than just birds of prey. Well, I know it's a bigger picture than birds of prey. Um, those birds of prey right now that are Arctic species, if you look at what the weather was in Canada, and it may still be now 46.6 degrees centigrade, Jer falcons are not going to be having a good time. Neither are the things that they eat. I would definitely want, not want to be a polar bear right now. If we go on cutting forests the way we are, then the forest species are not going to survive. 
but what people don't seem to realize is neither are we. So we are in a very seriously scary position right now. And you have to look at a wider picture rather than just birds of prey. Interesting. Jemima, what advice do you have for aspiring bird of prey conservationists? First of all, don't expect to make a living that gives you any money because it won't. My sister's a doctor and she was horrified at the fact that when she goes to a conference and she's asked to give a paper, she gets her airfare page, usually business class, um, and she has a hotel sorted for her. And no, by no stretch of imagination does she have to pay to go to the conference. If I give a paper at a conference, I pay my own airfare, I pay my own hotel, and I pay the bloody conference fee as well. So it's, it's a very different field than say medicine or veterinary medicine either. Um, when people say I want to be a conservationist, I usually think, oh my God, do they really know what conservation is? Um, I, as you know, I've been working in India now for 22 years, I think it's 22 years, on vulture conservation. So I've been going out to India and you think, ah, oh, that's so exciting. Um, and I designed the conservation breeding program and the aviaries because of all the stuff that we do here. I've taken my staff out to teach incubation, in fact, two different members of staff, and that was very interesting. One was male, one was female. One, um, both of them were less, I don't want to say aggressive than I am, but less powerful in terms of personality and also a lot younger and age makes a huge difference um, I mean I'm female which is against me I'm old which is for me um, and I, I'm fairly sort of forward going and, and what's the word I want not aggressive but speak my mind um, and that that goes for me so for women you've got more of a hard job than men especially if you're going to go abroad. And I don't care what anybody says, you do. Um, there are some places in India I will not go on my own. And I have been followed before now. Um, and when I go, I'm doing conservation and I'm working on, in the conservation field and I'm usually staying in awful hotels. I did rescue a black rat out of the loo one time. Walked out with it in a towel, chucked it outside. And then asked for a clean towel. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's hot and you get bitten by mosquitoes and you might get dengue fever. But, and I don't like Indian food anyway, which is a bit of a disaster, but you have to know that you're doing it because it needs to be doing and it's good for whatever the task it is that you've set yourself. You, you have to, it's a very fine line between being too pushy, and that goes for the first time you go for conferences as well, incidentally. Um, I've had people come up to me and they're really pushy and I'm going, whoa, hang on a minute, just back off a bit because you won't gain friends and influence people like that. There's a fine line and balance between being interested, wanting to know, being delighted when people help you, um, not fading into the background like a dead mouse, but not charging forward like a bull in a china shop. And it is a fine line. Um, and it gets finer when you have to deal with the politics of conservation. And I would say that 50% of conservation is dealing with politics. That's dealing with people, dealing with politicians, trying to persuade the people you're working with, this won't work and this will. Uh, not saying I told you so when it doesn't because they didn't take any notice of you, which occasionally they do but instead trying to encourage them and make sure that it works. And again, when I say practical, um, we have a lot of students here and we also, when we um, advertise for jobs to, for people to come and work here, um, most of the time we ask for a first degree, not always, it depends what the job is. And I have been saddened by how little practicality students have these days. They don't know the difference between a spade and a shovel. They can't hold a hammer properly. 
They don't know how to use a saw. They certainly don't know how to use an electric drill. And when you go out on a conservation project in the middle of nowhere, you need to be able to do things like that. You need to be able to, when, for example, in India, the first time we had perches in the aviaries, we had to use eucalyptus wood because the other woods that would have been much more useful were on protected trees. We've got bloody eucalyptus trees everywhere. It should be in Australia, I might point out. Um, and they make dreadful perches for birds because there's no bark worth talking about and they're really slippery and you end up with foot sores. And so a lot of people say, well, why don't you put AstroTurf on them, which is, as you know, that plastic grass-like stuff, which I actually don't like anyway. Um, you can't get AstroTurf in India. And if you could get it, it would be bloody expensive. But what you can get is coconut rope. So if you wind that round and round and round and round the perch, you're able to make a perch that is very good for the bird's feet. They have tremendous fun ripping it all off. And then you can pay somebody to wind it all back on again. So everybody benefits, but it's being able to think, okay, we have to solve this problem. We're in another country. What can we get that we can do it with that's going to be good for the birds? Amongst other things then, practical skills and political diplomacy. Yes. I mean, everybody I've spoken to who's spent any time in Africa, they've done things like fixing pipes, mending fences, moving barbed wire. A lot of it is practical. And it's hard work and it's physical and it's dirty and it's uh, you get cut and you get grubby and you get bitten by things. Um, but that, that's conservation. Jemima, what's the most treasured possession in your hawking bag? In my hawking bag? Mm. Hmm. I'm quite fussy about my lure sticks. They have to be the right weight. And I have, as you can see, I've got arthritis now in this hand. So I need Leo sticks that are thin, but are heavy. Um, and a friend of mine makes them for me, but he makes them out of wood that was usually dyed and felled here at the center. So they are special wood made for me, the right size, the right weight. And I guess in my hawking bag, that's probably about the most special thing. The, um, the, there's an awful lot in there that isn't special. <laughs> Jemima, what's your best bird of prey fact, please? Ooh. I guess for me, it's flight. I like to watch how each individual bird flies. And so, they're all so different and they all have different capabilities but flight leads to feathers and if you look at some of the facts about feathers they are absolutely amazing how many different types of feathers there are why they're the shape they are how a condor's tail fe uh, wing feather i can't do it with that hand literally bends all the way up almost at a right angle um, I think probably feathers are the most amazing fact for me. Jemima, is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm thinking in terms of perhaps your involvement in India and Nepal with the vulture conservation. Yes, and I mean, that came to me because I went to conferences. Because I went to conferences, I met people, I talked to them, some of them came here. So they knew what we knew here. They knew we knew a lot about vultures that we had bred vultures. And so the chap who was originally contacted by the, actually the Parsis in India um, contacted me and said, could I help? So I went over and this was before the, there'd been people shouting about the decline. Um, so that was 1998, I think. Uh, 1999, there was a big conference called, which I went to, and I knew the people from the RSPB and uh, ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, because I'd worked with them before. And so we got together and were part of one of the teams looking to see what caused the decline. We lost 40 million vultures in 20 years which is absolutely staggering. 
I mean, it's it's never been beaten. We haven't managed that one yet. Well, we have. Um, and then in 2004, an American guy called Lindsay Oates, who very sadly is no longer with us, uh, discovered that it was diclofenac that had killed the vultures. And it was very hard to get people to believe it. Uh, I mean, some of the theories were that, well, they'd all gone, so maybe they'd migrated to Australia. I think the Australians might have noticed if 40 million vultures turned up. Um, there, was, there was a thought that the Americans had been hoovering them up in a big aeroplane, but I don't think they did that either. Um, and it was diclofenac because the slightly annoying thing for me being not only a bird of prey fanatic, but also a bird of prey lover is that science wins the day. Therefore, you have to kill birds with diclofenac or whatever else it is you think poisons them. And then you have to write a paper and it has to be published before anybody believes you. And there are two things that slightly annoy me about that. A, that you have to kill anything to, to prove that 40 million birds have died because of diclofenac. Although an awful lot of birds were tested and it was proved that they, it was diclofenac. And B, which, and I think this is almost worse, when a scientist discovers something, he won't shout, he or she won't shout about it until it is published. I guess because they're frightened that somebody else will jump on their bandwagon. But to me, that's morally wrong. If you found something that works or that you can solve, you shouldn't wait for the damn thing to be published. And you know what? That's the good thing about COVID. Everybody's worked together. Millions of pounds have been thrown at it. And research that would have taken 10 years has been done in one. And people say, oh, well, how can it be done in one year? It takes 10 years normally. It takes 10 years because there's no money thrown at it. When you throw money and scientists at something like COVID, not only does it get done, but everybody shares the answers. And that, to me, is very special. Wow. Jemima Perry Jones, MBE, Director of the International Bird of Prey Centre in the UK. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. It's a pleasure.